thumbs up, so I may begin. Thank you, Ed. I want to start with a riddle my mother was fond of saying, and I'll see if you get the answer to this riddle. Okay, you ready? Everyone listening? Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Jews, spell it with two letters and I'll give you one of my shoes. You need me to say that again? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Jews, spell it with two letters and I'll give you one of my shoes. I'm waiting. <laughs> Are you trying to think of how to spell Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. <laughs> that isn't what I asked you to spell. Spell it. Spell it. <laughs> IT, two letters. No one gets one of my shoes today. Okay. Well, I want to tell you a little bit more just briefly about Nebuchadnezzar and the people of Israel. Several great tragedies, and I'm sure many great tragedies have happened to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people. One of the more recent, obviously, was the Holocaust in the 1930s and 40s. Go back almost 2,000 years, A.D. 70, when the Romans fully destroyed the nation of Israel, destroyed most of Jerusalem and the temple that Herod had built. And the only thing left of that temple, as you probably know, is the Wailing Wall. But 600 years before that, the Babylonian Empire and the armies of King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Israel, destroyed Jerusalem, all its walls, and destroyed the beautiful temple that King Solomon had built. 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And what the Babylonian armies did was they deported most of the population of Jerusalem and around the city of Jerusalem to Babylon which today is pretty much close to what we know as Baghdad. The Babylonian Empire was mostly made up of what is modern-day Iraq. And the people of Israel, who were taken to exile there in Babylon, were, bu were befuddled, to say the least, because several hundred years before this, God had made a promise first to King David and to his son Solomon that I will never let anything happen to Jerusalem or to the temple that Solomon will build. I will always protect it. And one specific promise he made to David, always there will be a king on the throne of Israel in your line. There will always be your descendants who will reign over the nation of Israel. But the people are now befuddled as they lay in anguish, for the most part, though that will change somewhat. Over the next 70 years, that is where they will spend their time in Baghdad, Babylon, wondering why did God renege on his promise? Why did he allow this to happen? Are the gods of the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar stronger than the God of Israel? Why has he forgotten us? Why has he forsaken us? Was he not worth anything to begin with? What are we to do? And many people began to worship some of the gods of the Babylonians. But there were some heroes, right? You remember them? Daniel in the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And the king was surprised that uh, he looked in the little window in the fiery furnace, and they're still there. But there's a fourth person, you may remember. An angel. But those were, unfortunately, in some ways, the exception to the faith of the people then, they were about to give up and just decide this is where we're going to stay and we'll just have to adapt to a new way of life and a new religion. But God wasn't done with it. In fact, if we see the first scripture lesson which you see on your screen, this is the words of Jeremiah to the people. Actually, this is at the beginning of those 70 years of exile that the people would experience. He was thrown in jail for prophesying about this coming exile because of the people's unfaithfulness. But this is what he said while he was in jail, saying, this is the word of the Lord to you. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So these were words that Jeremiah left for the people as they were going into this.
this 70 year period of exile. God's saying, I still have a plan for you. I've not deserted you. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope, and there is a future still for you. In other words, those promises he made to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, to Moses, to David and Solomon, I'm going to keep them. It may not be in the way you expected, but I'm going to keep them so you can have hope for your future. And then, near the end of those 70 years, the prophet Isaiah speaks to the people, sharing these words from God. This is what God says near the end of that 70 years before they're able to come back. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers, and the badlands. Wild animals will say thank you, including the coyotes and the buzzards, because I provided water in the desert, rivers, through the sun-baked earth, drinking water for the people I chose, the people I made especially for myself, a people custom-made to praise me. And friends, what I'm going to suggest in the sermon today, that right now, Right here, with Colonial Park Community Baptist Church, God is making himself a custom-made people for today to praise him and to serve. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for all the ways you have been with us in the past, especially for us in these last seven years since this church was founded. And we pray, Lord, that as society has changed and we are a new people, somewhat different from those who started this congregation, you have a mission for us today, a custom-made one, where you see the needs around us, you see the hurt and the pain and the lostness, and we pray, Lord, that you will use us in a new way, perhaps, to reach out and share your love in words and in deeds. So bless us, Father, as we think this morning about the plans you may have for us and how you will make us a custom-made church, especially for today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Excuse me a second. When I take a drink of water like that, I remember Marco Rubio, and have you ever heard of him? Several years ago, he did the Republican response to the State of Union address, and he had a bottle of water over here, and every few minutes he'd step over here like this and take a drink of water. So I always think of him when I take a drink of water. But hopefully uh, you won't think of me like I thought of Marco Rubio. It seems a little, a little crazy. <clears throat> so, 70 years that the people of Israel were in exile, as I mentioned in the prayer, that's the same amount of time that this church has been here. But obviously you had a mostly different experience from the people of Israel in those 70 years that they spent in exile in Babylon. Back in the 50s and 60s and 70s and maybe into the 80s, I imagine this church was prospering. I don't know that for sure, but I imagine because most churches were at that time. It was a time when churches were respected. Uh, you didn't have much else to do on Sunday, especially in the 50s and 60s. Uh, maybe here in Pennsylvania, you also had blue laws, like I know we had in Virginia, where most businesses could not be open on Sunday. And probably sports, youth sports leagues weren't played on Sunday. Uh, my father was told he couldn't go fishing on Sunday, but that was, that was just his grandmother's rules, not necessarily <laughs> any blue laws rules. But it was the thing to do for most people to be in church. Church was a respected institution. It was a place that most people understood was important. But things have changed over the course of the 70 years, especially in the last 20 or 30 years. And no doubt you, like many churches, have struggled to stay afloat. Uh, members, membership numbers change. And when membership changes, obviously financial things change. But especially I know, <coughs> excuse me, as some of you have shared with me, over the last three years since COVID hit us, it's been especially difficult for you as it has been for many small
all our churches. Uh, I understand uh, three years ago, your total attendance on Sunday morning with your two services was in the 50s. And now, as you know, it's, in, I guess, about 25 or thereabouts on average. And because of COVID, you haven't been able to do many of the outreach programs you usually did on a regular basis, which typically brought in new members. So COVID has been difficult for many, many small churches, and you have expected it and experienced it too. And you know, uh, we're not alone, right? There are other churches out there competing for members. I hate to use the word competing, but they're out there. And uh, there are many choices that new people can go to, right? And often what happens when a pastor leaves a church, especially after a long period of time of serving, uh, a number of people saw their identity as a part of that church with that pastor. So if that pastor isn't there anymore, uh, some people just don't feel at home anymore and choose to find another place. So it's natural for every congregation right now, uh, especially smaller ones, to begin to wonder, is there a future for our congregation beyond this 70th year? <clears throat> so one thing I don't want us to get trapped in is the folly of extrapolation, or excuse me, extrapolation. Put a U in there where there was supposed to be a no. That's a word you use all the time, right? Extrapolation, you extrapolate. Well, what in the world does that mean? Most of you probably know. Well, extrapolation, <clears throat> excuse me, is basically a way of making guesses or predictions about the future based on how things have gone up until this time. So in other words, if things continue just as they have been, on into the future, then we know how things are going to end up after a certain amount of time. So it's basically your best guess about what things are going to look like, so let's say five years from now, if things continue on the track that they're going right now. So we could, excuse me, we could choose to extrapolate about the future of the Christian church and of this congregation. You've heard from many sources, no doubt. Uh, sometimes from preachers, sometimes from denominational people, and from other members, perhaps, about concerns about how long individual churches can survive. And after all, as you know, churches are facing some challenging times right now. So we have to admit, numbers don't look good, and if they, things continue the way they are, they look worse. Denominations, including American Baptists, regularly report widespread decline. More and more people are turned off by church. You've probably heard of the nuns and the duns, right? The nuns are those who say they have no religious preference. And that segment of the population is growing and growing. About 25% of the population say they really don't want to be involved with a religious institution. They say, well, I'm spiritual but not religious. I don't need a church. And therefore, they don't show up or have an interest in showing up. And then there are the Duns, D-O-N-E-S, those who have gotten disillusioned with the church and have decided to leave. And that segment of the population is growing. Many of them, and many, especially millennials, those between the ages of 20 and uh, maybe their late 30s, see the institution of the church as something that's only interested in its survival. And they don't need to help us survive. That's all that we're about. Uh, some people see the church as all about nickels, nails, and noses. Nickels about money. Uh, nails about the building and keeping it together. And noses about keeping enough people in the pews. And if that's all the church is about, some people are saying, oh, well, I'm not interested in helping you do that. If that's all you're about. Nickels, nails, and noses. So thousands of congregations we know close actually daily because of the lack of people, <coughs> money, interest. <coughs> Pardon me. The devil doesn't want me to say this today. <laughs> There's a little devil in my throat. So I apologize, but not for him. And you know, mega churches, I don't know, I don't know Harrisburg well enough yet to know what mega churches are around here. But most megachurches get all their oodles of numbers of members by pulling people away from smaller congregations in their neighborhood. Uh, they're thieves, basically, many of them. 
So if these circumstances we are facing keep going in the same direction, are the institutional lives of churches doomed? So what about us? What kind of future do we have as an institution? Will there be a 75th anniversary if nothing changes? So is there a word of the Lord for us? Is God with us or not? So the passage of scripture that we just saw from Isaiah was written, as I said, to the Israeli exiles almost at the end of that 70 years to let them know it's almost over. Our exile is almost over. Something big is going to happen that's going to change everything. So just as Jeremiah prophesied 70 years before, the people of Israel, Isaiah was saying, we're about to see something new that God is going to do that will fulfill everything that Jeremiah said. God has specific plans for us still, even though we had proved unfaithful. So God says there in that Isaiah passage, don't keep ruminating over everything that's happened in the past, no matter how good or bad it was. I'm about to do something else, something brand new. And I believe God's doing that now too. I believe that because over the years, the church has seen many challenges and heartaches, many changes in society have come about over these last 2,000 years, and the church has not just survived, but thrived. And that can be true for us today. In fact, with all the challenges that churches are facing, and yes, many congregations are choosing to close, I believe that this year, 2023, is the best year ever for the church. And it can be for Colonial Park as well. Why can I say that, or what do I, what do I expect that to be? Well, you know what, I don't know for sure, but I believe it will be true. I believe because I've seen what the church has done in the past, I've heard at least about what you have done in your 70 years, and I believe Jesus when he said, my church will stand forever. The gates of hell, in fact, will not be able to prevail against it. So whatever challenges the evil one is placing upon the church today, he will not win. That's another two-letter word, right? And it's a big one. If, maybe, just maybe, you and I are willing to let God, right here and right now, custom make us into something brand new that will bring Him even greater praise than the last 70 years have. If we're willing to involve, uh, if we're willing to get involved with something new, whatever that is that God is going to provide. God is leading the change, if God is trying to create something new here, what should we do? We should get on board. We should get on board. And that means we have to believe that things do not have to continue going in the same direction like they have over the last three years at least. Things can change. God can make something new out of us. Our demise is not inevitable. So let me tell you about the great horse manure crisis of 1894. You've heard of that, right? I mean, it was a crisis. This is what I read about. And some of this will be obvious to you. In 1894, I'll start over here. The primary form of transportation in the late 1800s was by what? Horses, right? And by the early 1900s, the number of people living in cities had doubled, while the population of horses had actually tripled. London, which then was the largest city in the world in 1900, had 11,000 horse-drawn calves, and there were several thousand buses, each needing 12 horses per day. So think of it. Several thousand buses needing 12 horses each per day. And the horses did what as they traveled around the city? They left something behind, right? The streets of London and New York City began to fill with manure. And in 1894, a writer for the Times of London predicted that in 50 years, every street in London would be buried under nine feet of manure. <laughs> and 
that would be a crisis, no doubt. But something happened. Necessity bred innovation. And horses were replaced by motor vehicles of all sorts. So what does that say to us? Doomsday scenarios usually overlook a vital truth. Things can change, and they will. Those who make straight line projections, extrapolations about the future, fail to account for innovation, for creativity, and most of all, for God-inspired change that we don't see yet. So forth. So friends, here on February 19th in the year 2023, this is no time to relax or give in to the temptation to, admit, to dismiss the facts of the church's situation with just a naive belief that somehow all will work out for good. Because every congregation, including ours, needs to take a fearless look at itself and admit that its future is likely grim if God isn't ready to do something for us and we're ready to get on board. Fear may be our starting point, but it must soon give way to God-inspired hope and hard work if we are to endure, not just to survive, but to thrive. Because you know what? Motor vehicles didn't just drop out of the sky in the early 1900s. They came about because inventors painstakingly tried and failed with hundreds of ideas. And the same will be true for the new life that our churches will embrace. Our new life, the custom-made thing that God is about to do here, will require one step at a time. It will involve change. And all kinds of change typically involve some pain and, from time to time, some failure. But that's how you make progress. That's how you continue to do God's will. Sometimes you fail and learn and do things better. And it will require great humility. So thankfully, you and I come from a long line of those who defy conventional wisdom and were willing to adapt to the unexpected. Like Noah, and Abraham, and Mary, and Paul, all of our forefathers and foremothers proved the idea that an uncertain future could be faced with confidence if they followed the Spirit's leadership. And that's what you and I are going to do, right? We're going to follow the Spirit's leadership. That's how the church has thrived until today. So a question I have for you, Ed, if you do the next slide. I understand that it was either five or ten years ago uh, the church went through about a three or four month process of coming up with or deciding on what you believed as a church was your mission. And you'll see that. Yeah, I've seen it on the cover of your membership directory. It's uh, placed out on the, just the inside of the entrance of, the, of the, uh, the search outside here to our left. So this is what either five or ten years ago, uh, I understand, you said, this is why we're here. This is what we're all about. We are called to help people in our community build dynamic relationships with Jesus through the power of his love. So when you say you're called, that's a calling, right? That God has called you. So apparently, when you came up with this statement, you believe God himself was actually calling you to do this, to help people in our community. And when you said our community, I don't know how you define the boundaries of that, whether it's a mile with it, you know, a mile radius of the church, or maybe farther. I know some of you live farther than a mile from the church, right? Uh, but at least it seems to me you're saying you were defining your community, and I'll just, since I don't know for sure, at least a mile within our church, we want to help people build dynamic relationships with Jesus through the power of his love. So I think an important question for you to answer right now as you begin your search for your next pastor, is God still calling us to do that? Is that our primary mission? And if it is, every, just about everything you do as a church should be in support of fulfilling that mission. So one thing you also ask yourselves, how have we been doing over these last five or ten years? What's the evidence that people are building dynamic relationships with Jesus through the power of his love because of what we have been doing for the last five or ten or seventy years. How are we doing in fulfilling that mission? And perhaps today we might need to reconsider, is that really what God is calling us to do today? Uh, is that calling 
changed in some way? Uh, is it more specific? Or is God saying, yes, that's still my mission for you, my calling for you, and these are some new ways I want you to help fulfill that. So, question we need to ask. Are people in our community building dynamic relationships with Jesus because of what we are doing? And one way, perhaps a new way that you might do that if you still believe that's your mission, that uh, our acting executive director of Advocat, Mark, suggested to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, was one thing that he has been seeing God doing new, both here in America and in England, is something called Dinner Church. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that. It's become quite popular and effective over the last 10 to 15 years. It's an established church inviting anybody and everybody, sort of like Jesus in that one parable, uh, go out to the highways and byways and invite everyone in. So this is an invitation a church makes to anybody and everybody in their community or anyone who can hear the invitation once a month or so, which includes Jesus. Jesus is included in the dinner. After all, Jesus ate gladly with sinners, right? He was criticized for that, but that's what Jesus did. So churches have found that a lot of people who might not want to come to a worship service in a sanctuary like this on Sunday morning would be open to coming to dinner at another time and in a different part of your building. Mark suggests that if this is something we would like to try, he thought it might be a very fitting thing for us given who we are. And it would be a good way, he thinks, to reach people of our age. Uh, adults, in other words. And likely adults similar in age to those of us who attend now. So could it be that the majority of people living in our community, let's say within a mile or so of our church, who are not now Christians or who are perhaps lapsed churchgoers, might come to an informal dinner along with Jesus if invited by us. And Mark said, we could probably get funds from Advocat to pay for the food, like I mentioned last week. Their grants, we can get up to $5,000 for new ministry efforts. That's something at least I'd suggest you consider and something with the people that you have now and the resources that could be available to us, you could probably pull off. Uh, but that's just one idea. Uh, no doubt there are many other ideas, and I know in the profile that you've been filling out, one of the questions was, what other new ministries might you be interested in starting? So this is one perhaps you could add to that list. And also something that I want to offer to you, which is some of the resources that I have from my training as an intentional interim pastor. Uh, Ten years ago, or actually it's more than that, I went through a process of being trained to be an intentional interim pastor. And that's a pastor who serves in two ways, uh, both as the pastor of the church, but also as a consultant to help you plan for uh, what you will uh, hopefully need to be doing in, in fulfilling God's will for your church right now as you also plan to find a new pastor who will help you fulfill that mission. So I'll be mentioning this to our church council after our worship service today. Offering, and this is just an offer you don't have to accept, right? That sounds like mission impossible. <laughs> Helping you to perhaps answer two important questions that a new pastor will be interested in hearing the answers to. Who are you right now? Who is Colonial Park Community Baptist Church right now? What are your values? What's most important to you? What do you feel God is calling you to be right now that you agree to or you have consensus about? What is it you most value? What do you believe God is asking of you right here and now? So again, if uh, the church council feels that that would be a good thing uh, to accept from me, I would be glad to do that. To also work, uh, hopefully it's that kind of work would support the work your search committee is doing as well. Because as I said earlier, friends, here in the year 2023, I believe God is doing something brand new. Something new that is essential to the plans that God has for Colonial Park Community Baptist Church. And as Isaiah asked, don't you already see it? Can you begin to see what God has in mind? The 
wonderful things he still has for you to do, and that you will be able to celebrate on your 75th anniversary. So see you, friends. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray that we can see that things don't have to stay the same. And we know, Lord, that you do have a future for us. We may not yet know all the details or all the things we will need to do to get to that fulfillment of that plan, but you have a plan for us. So Lord, pull our hearts and minds and spirits together so that together we can see what you are about to do and that we can get on board and do the things that you need us to do for this community that we serve. So bless us, Heavenly Father, and may you be blessed in all that we do together.